I think as neurosurgeons, we're in a unique opportunity to uh, take care of patients, see these very complicated diseases that we take care of, but we also have an opportunity and an obligation, I think, to move the field forward. And that happens through facilities like yours where you're, you're teaching and innovating on the surgical techniques. But I've also taken the approach of looking around my workspace and going, I don't like this, or this seems to be silly, or we've been doing this for 50 or 60 years, or seems like there may be an opportunity to do something better. And so I've had a nice opportunity over the last almost 10 years now to work on a variety of different uh, devices and, and products that have come out of the university. So I want to kind of tell you initially how that got started and then kind of walk through a roadmap for you of how this actually happens. Because when I talk about this, I explain it in, to lay people and say it's like taking out a, a brain tumor. So you learn during your training the 100 or 150 steps that it takes to go from opening to closing and taking that tumor out. And it's a learned process that we all go through. And innovation and commercialization and being able to move ideas to actual real things, there's actually a sequence and a process that you go through to do this. And you can learn this and it gets easier. Just like surgery gets easier over time and you get more expert at it, you can become more expert at doing this. And the friction to get things out uh, reduces as you learn what you're doing. So the way this started, uh, I work at Children's in town here and uh, I've been treating hydrocephalus you know, it's a huge part of our practice, obviously. And as you guys know, the valves have a very high failure rate. Shunts have a high failure rate. So 40% fail within two years. If you look at the devices critically, they really haven't changed since very much, at least since the engineers invented this, uh, you know, 40, 50 years ago. They're not smart. They don't do a lot to reduce failures, things like this. So I got interested in this problem. And uh, largely because I didn't want to keep coming in at 2 o'clock in the morning to do shunt revision. And so I went over to the university and just went to bioengineering and asked if there was anybody that I could meet with who might be interested in my problem. So I sat down, a nice young engineer there, uh, explained what I was interested in, had a couple sketches of ideas for initially was going to be a fully implantable electromechanical valve. And he got interested in my problem. He came to the operating room, and we did that day, uh, as often happens, we did three shunts in a row. He was fairly horrified by that experience and then signed on to help me. So kind of fast forward, we ended up realizing that doing an implantable valve was going to be extraordinarily expensive. There's different paths through the FDA that I'll talk about in this, in this lecture a little bit. But we thought it was going to be 40 or $50 million to come up with a new valve that was fully electromechanical and could register ICP and all this stuff. But we realized that that same technology could be used to manage uh, EVD. And if you look at EVDs, the way we manage them now, it's quite archaic. The patient sits up, lays down, they overdrain, underdrain. Every hospital in the US has sentinel events around EVDs. And we just thought there was an opportunity to take the same technology we're thinking for an implant and apply it to EVD. So fast forward, we ended up bringing that company uh, or starting a company outside of the university, licensing the technology. The company's in Bothell. Uh, we have FDA clearance on the device. It's in clinical trials. You guys are actually a site for us here to use uh, the device. It's called Aqueduct. And we uh, think it's going to have the potential to completely revolutionize the way uh, EVDs are managed. And it's probably one of the most common things done in neurosurgery around the world. So something that we think is impactful can reduce the cost of uh, uh, taking care of patients. And so it got me very interested in this whole, whole process and have subsequently done it several times. So at the end, I'll show you a couple of things that we've, we've worked on. And the helmet certainly one of the most, uh, most fun ones. So the disclosures, usually everybody's running away from their disclosures. I'm like very proud of these things. So uh, there's four companies I started and a couple others that I'm helping out with. So, you know, some of the key points that I want to bring up in this lecture is, you know, you really want to go from the idea to the solution. So a lot of us will get hit up by the device companies or an engineer will come to you and say, I made this thing. How would you guys want to use it? And I think that's actually the wrong direction. You want to actually come to them with a clinical need. You have a usually a clear idea or at least a good idea how to make the problem better. They do much better when you bring the concepts to them. Um, 
to me, team is everything around this. So you want to find the right partner and right engineering people to be able to help you. And you have to stay very engaged in this process or else you'll never see it come to fruition. So the idea and a lot of physicians and surgeons think you're going to go to somebody, say, hey, I need this thing. And then somebody's going to go make the thing that's actually going to work for you in some way. And I rarely find that that's the case. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. For me in the university, I talk about this that I don't like doing science projects where they sit in the university and linger for years and get grants and all that because it never becomes real. And this whole idea of translation that we talk about, you really have to get it outside of the academic world and touch patients for it to be meaningful in some way. And so we've very quickly had the uh, strategy of spinning companies up and then pulling the technology out of the university. And I got roundly criticized for that early on. They're like, yo, you're starting a company after you know, six months of working on this thing, what are you doing? And now everybody seems to be doing that. Uh, technology transfer is an important thing. Who's going to license or who's going to do patents for you? Are they going to follow through on that? Are they going to involve you? Do you get royalties? How do you license it? It's a complicated sort of business thing, and I'll talk a touch about that. And then I think as physicians, we need to recognize what you know and what you don't know, right? So as surgeons, we're very good. We know sort of the anatomy. We know the problem. We know what we're trying to fix. But you generally don't know how to build a device, and most of us are horrible business people, at least when we enter practice. And so a recognizing what you don't know, I think, is an important piece of being successful and bringing people around you who know how to help. And it, it's not easy to succeed. Like that product, the first one I was just telling you about, we've been working on this for like eight years now. And I think it's going to hopefully get acquired this year and then out into mainstream practice. But it's not been a straightforward thing. So again, you know, for me, these ideas, we all have them. We all have ways we think we want to improve what we're doing. And the challenge here is, is really directing the engineering. And again, I find it very common that like at the university, the engineers in biomedical engineering or EE or whatever it might be, are working on these projects, they come to a point, they think, oh, that might have a medical application, and they come to you. And it's much harder to shoehorn something in than to start from scratch with your idea and what you need and then go to those guys. So on this first project, I think, you know, as, as surgeons, you are, are going to get it done, right? Like you're going to take some from the front to the back and not give up. And so when I first went over to bioengineering, the first guy I met with, I remember this vividly, sat down. He seemed pretty interested in what I was talking about. And I said, hey, come to the operating room because these guys got to come to you and see what you're doing because they need to see the environment. So I go to this guy come over, watch me operate. Like, what time do you start? Well, we start like 7.30. And he said, well, I don't come in until 10.30. And that didn't register with me initially. And I go, well, we start at 7.30. He's like, I don't come till 10.30. So that guy obviously was not going to be the right guy for me. So I went back to the chairman of the department. I said, this guy, not my guy. Can you find me somebody else? And then I ended up with this very brilliant young engineer who was very motivated to do something meaningful. And so you got to pick the right partner. It's very, very important. I talked a little bit about this. You know, I do believe in basic science. I think the university has a role in basic science. There are basic science things that are going on that are fundamentally important that are going to take 10, 15, 20 years to probably arrive at a solution, right? Curing cancer, immunotherapy, all these things, there's a roadmap that's important, but it's very long term. And I'm pretty impatient, as most neurosurgeons are, and sort of this idea of things just sitting in the university and percolating and baby steps. I don't really care for that. So what we wanted to do was really develop this idea of getting things moving uh, more quickly. And what's challenging is most places don't have a startup mentality. It's a little different in Seattle. It's kind of fun here because you can find that energy in people who want to engage in this way. But in the university, they think long term. They don't think, let's get it up, let's get it running, <laughs> let's hire up, let's move quickly through this process. And so it's a, a bit of a stretch sometimes to come in and talk to a research collaborator and go, 
hey, we're gonna work on this for a couple months and then we're gonna start a company and then we're gonna parallel path this and use NIH money for the university and private funding to accelerate what we're doing. But I think they're starting to recognize that these are viable options for them because funding sources are very challenging these days for these guys. And so private equity or money that can be brought in to accelerate what they're doing has been very beneficial uh, for us. We do still go after grants because grants are what's called non-dilutive funding. So your ownership in the company, if you can get free money, as it's called, is a good thing. So we always try to do both, but you don't bank on getting an NIH grant. You supplement that with other funds is the way we've moved these things along uh, uh, quickly. And there's always a little bit of friction between you know, the university and sort of industry. Uh, they look oftentimes, as I'm sure you guys know, as outside entities as being evil and sort of businesses and companies are just trying to use the university. But I've made a different argument. If you look at Stanford, for example, or MIT, They've been very proactive at trying to leverage the intellect that's uh, in their institution. They want to spin companies out because it's a virtuous cycle for them. A company does well, like a Google or whatever it might be, they're going to see very significant funds come in off of royalties. And then those guys who've done well and now return to campus in their Ferrari are the ones who are going to donate money back to the university. So they've recognized that this is a very viable and important model, and they want that to be happening. So the University of Washington is getting much more sophisticated around uh, this idea and encouraging uh, this. And I think as we talk to like my colleagues and people at, at Children's, for example, people are coming up with ideas and they want to see these things happen and, and not live forever as a, a project in the university. So one of the challenges as you're developing your idea is protecting your idea. So as I go out and I'm talking to an investor, they want to know, have you protected this concept? So that's patenting, generally speaking, or copyright if it's software. And so it's a very important process. And for folks who are not kind of in this space, we used to always think you could do your idea, you would write it down, you would sign it and date it. And that used to be acceptable, and if there was ever a question of somebody inventing around the same time as you, you tie back to your notes. So the patent office got smarter about this, and they have what's called first to file. So it's actually the first one to file in the office and get a stamp that they received it from the patent office. That's what's called your priority date, and that's the date that everybody's looking at that the invention was first disclosed. So there's a bit of a, a, a race, if you will, to get your idea and actually officially get it in. The idea of sitting around for five or six years, drawing and sketching and coming up with your idea before you file it, you can get scooped by somebody else. And so that's a law change that happened within the last several years. So what I'll typically do is when I have an idea that I like and there's some kind of focus around it, what I'll do is we'll do what's called a provisional patent. So a provisional patent's essentially a placeholder. So you would go to the tech transfer office, you submit um, some different things around the idea and then they'll file with the office what's called a provisional patent. The, patents, the provisional patent's good for a year. At the end of the year, what you have to do is convert it into a full patent. And the challenge largely around this is the cost. So a provisional patent, just the filing fees are quite cheap. And if you have an attorney do it, it's maybe five grand, 10 grand, something like that. To convert a patent over becomes a much more expensive process. So that's usually about $25,000 by the time that you've actually taken that material formulated it properly and then submitted it. So these become expensive endeavors and you have to have a tech transfer organization or you have to take that upon yourself to go out and do it. But it's a very critical step because you may have a brilliant idea and if you move it outside and you start to try and develop a business around it, the first thing that an investor is going to ask you is, do you actually own this in some way? Are there patents? Are there things around it that are going to protect somebody else from coming in and doing the exact same thing? And the other thing that I tell people is if you have an idea, you know, Google has 50 different drop downs. So there's Google patent search. And if you have an idea, just like you get on PubMed, you can get on Google Patent Search, put in keywords, and it'll list all the patents that are relevant. So every time I think I have a bright idea, I look, and half the time there's 
10 other people have had that bright idea years before me. And so you want to see if you can either move through that space and do something that's novel, or if they've covered all the things that you have, maybe you want to think of something else before you spend a lot of energy to develop something that somebody else has the rights to. And then as you get further down the line, as you work on the patent portfolio, you want to go to different countries and things like that, and that's when it actually gets quite expensive. So to nationalize patents is what it's called, can be anywhere from sixty dollars to $80,000. So it's not an inexpensive thing, and what's been nice being in the university is they front those costs and cover that, and then they get it paid back at the back end. So I'm not paying out of pocket in our model to do that, which has been very helpful, obviously. So I mentioned this before, I think it's really important to know what you know and what you don't know. And I, I think hopefully smartly early on recognize that I'm a busy neurosurgeon. I've got a full-time practice. I know some business, but it's not what I do every day. And so very early on, what we would do is as soon as we spun a company up with the engineer, we would bring in a business person. So we'd go find a CEO who wanted to work initially just for equity. So we'd bring them on, they would get some equity, and then as we raise more money, then they start to draw a salary. So they're incentivized to go out, raise funds for the company, and then build that. And if the company is successful, they own quite a bit of stock, and then they can do well. And there's people in our community in particular who like to do that. They're early stage startup guys will take the company to a point and then usually somebody else will take it on from that point forward or some of them will take it kind of front to back. But it's a really important piece of it. And the other thing I say is you got to stay involved, especially on the engineering side, because there's this thing that I like to call drift. So the engineers are brilliant, but they work in a vacuum. And so you say you want X, Y, and Z, they're going to try and get to Z, okay? But what they'll do is they'll kind of go off path from what's relevant and useful, like for example, in the operating room. So you have to keep them within the rails and that requires staying engaged with these guys over time. And I've seen it with everything I've worked on. They wanna go in some direction that to them makes sense. It's a very logical thing, but it actually takes it outside of the realm of being useful or it creates a problem for us. And that's where you provide a ton of value and the guys who just drop an idea off, that idea never ends up where you want it to end up. You got to be part of that process. So this is generally the pipeline that I've used just as an example. You know, I identify the need typically. I typically also will sketch some ideas down for what I think the product could be. So this has happened with the different things. I go to an engineer and I go, hey, this is my problem. I've got some ideas how to solve this. Can you engage with me? So we go through that process, start to build out the team, build some of the technology. Usually we'll try and prototype something and it can be the crappiest little prototype, but there's tremendous value in just being able to demonstrate that you can at least start to do the idea that you're talking about. And then we'll start to do the intellectual property and all that. And most of these things we've done off of grants initially through the university. We've got all these companies started off of $50,000 or somewhere in that general vicinity. So not, you know, millions, but, you know, decent chunk to kind of get it launched. So again, here's my process. You got to partner with the engineers. You got to file your intellectual property pretty early on. Grants are helpful and can be done early to get kind of seed funding to do it. And then the bigger grants are paired in my way of doing this with outside funds. So we do private funding and grants. I've tended to start these companies very early, and I think that there's advantages there as a founder uh, in the company, and to incentivize the business guys that come in. They wanna work for equity and ownership in the company, and it's a way to bring in a very skilled, seasoned person very early before you may have funds to pay that guy. So a good CEO is gonna make several hundred thousand dollars a year at a minimum. You don't have that money at the beginning, but if you give the guy a third of your company and he believes in what you're doing, he's gonna come in and wanna build that out so that he can have a return and reward on the end. We often will go after funding early on, and for folks who don't know this world, it's, it's very interesting. So there's different ways to get private capital. 
once you start up a company. And one of the most common ways we do this is through what's called seed funding. So the football helmet company, which I'll talk about in a moment, was I think one of the largest seed rounds in Seattle. And largely the way this came about were colleagues of mine, both in the nurse surgery and spine world uh, around the country liked the idea and they invested 10 to $50,000. And I have a buddy of mine who invested a lot more uh, uh, who's in private practice, which is smart on his part. Um, but he came in and uh, invested quite a bit. So we were able to actually circle up initially uh, a, a pretty sizable amount of money to get the company going with individual investments. So people talk about friends and family, but there's also this idea of angels. And the angels are the guys who are going to do a high risk investment uh, uh, very early on. But the high risk investment can yield a 10, 20x return. And so people will dedicate a portion of their portfolio to these high risk things. And so they'll vet and look at these uh, early companies and then in, in, uh, come in. And so we often will do that initially uh, to raise uh, money. And we will often do what's called a convertible note, which is essentially a loan. So we're not doing what's called a price round where you value the company. You're doing a convertible note. People will give you money. And then when you raise your next round, all of that converts into that next raise uh, for equity. So it's a nice way to do it without trying to put a value on what you're doing, because essentially what you are ideally doing is you're developing, developing, raising the value of your, your company before you take more money. So that insulates the early investors and the founders so that they continue to own a reasonable portion of the company. And then again, hiring the core team is important. So I'm going to show you a couple examples, and I'm happy to take some questions. So this is the aqueduct um, idea. So this is just out of our shop at Children's. You know, we'll have a ventriculostomy in place, and somebody will, you know, put this sign on: "Don't move the patient." Okay, without letting the nurse know. So the, everybody deals with this here. The families freak out about it. The nurses half the time can't get in there quick enough to do something. So that creates a lot of friction with the actual family and the nurse. There's problems that occur with this, obviously. And you're either you know, mismanaging the patient if it's too high or too low. And what we've learned, actually, is that the majority of times the number that you're looking at for the ICP is actually wildly inaccurate by a fact, you know, like five to 10 centimeters. It's horrifying, like when you really get deeper into what's going on with the technology. If you laser level it and you're just off by a couple degrees, it, it creates a huge variance in what we think we're measuring. And so we thought there was a nice opportunity to automate this. And so fast forward, what we have is a box that has a cartridge. And so this system down here just connects to the EVD in the standard way. There's a little reference that gets sutured uh, just right behind the ear that's to reference the EAM. Cartridge gets plugged in. You set the ICP that you want to target, alarms uh, for high and low ICP, high and low flow rate, and then it automatically regulates. So the patient can sit up, lay down, they can get up and walk around and move this thing, and it maintains a constant ICP. But yet, if there's an issue, you know, they rupture their aneurysm or whatever, and their ICP spikes, it's going to alarm and let somebody know. So the hope with this is it's going to provide better patient care. But when you talk to the hospital, what they care about is it's going to potentially save money because most places in the U.S. keep patients in the ICU with a ventric or they, or they do some workarounds. So like my buddies at St. Jude's, to put a kid on the floor, they'll splice a valve in series with, with, with the EVD so that they can put them on the floor. So all of a sudden, you're spending five dollars $800 just to put the patient on, on the floor. So we think that this is going to have great value and will really change the dynamic of how EVDs are, are managed. The second company I worked on, and just <laughs> briefly, the first thing, like the learning curve was very steep, and the CEO we brought on was a brilliant guy, had done five or six companies, and really took us under his wing and taught us sort of how to do this. 
This came out of the kind of a similar process. You know, we were in M&M and uh, one of the residents placed a ventric and it was in some very wacky spot. And we all always go, oh yeah, how do you do that, right? But if you look at the literature, which is fairly scant, 60% of UVDs are misplaced. And then as soon as there's any shift or anything, the calculus of dropping that drain is much more complicated as we all know. And this is not a hero procedure. This is a just, you wanna get it done and move on and take the tumor out, clip the aneurysm, whatever it is. So we had a guy in our department who's an ultrasound guy and I said, hey, can you put an ultrasound on the tip of a stylet that we'd put through the EVD? And what this thing will do, you can see the stylet that actually has an ultrasound probe at the tip and you get a mode ultrasound so when you look down the burr hole toward the ventricle you get two peaks the front and the back of the ventricle edge and just like with stealth or brain lab if you line it up properly you see those two peaks and if you keep those on the oscilloscope that's there and you go down you go right into the ventricle and if you're off if you're looking in the wrong direction those peaks go away and then you just reorient to get there so we've done extensive studies in animals and cadavers we're going to have first in man up in canada uh, a little later this year and this would basically just a disposable piece a little ipad type thing that you would kick onto the mayo you put the catheter uh, over it we're going to have a catheter with a little pinhole at the front of it to capture this and you drop it in. It increases the time of your workflow by about 20 seconds. And it's 100% accurate if you're using it right to get into the ventricle. And we've done it with like slit ventricles in pigs. It's very accurate. So we think that this is gonna be a very simple but fundamentally important change in practice and to use this type of thing. And as some of our critical care colleagues are starting to do these procedures to up their chance of getting this in the first time with a single pass is is critical and it's horrifying and we've all done this and pro a few people admit to it but like how many passes have you taken at at times 10 like somebody's dying you got to try and get this thing in so there's a paper published on this and the end went out to like 25 right that's not good so we just want to put it in once and be done so this is kind of the one of the fun ones. So uh, my chairman, Rich Ellenbogen, was helping with the NFL, started to put people on the sideline of NFL games. I was doing that as running the concussion program. Five years ago, everybody in Seattle with technology was looking at sensors. Struck me that this is really after the fact. So why aren't we doing something to help mitigate the risk of getting a concussion versus just diagnosing it? That led me to look at a football helmet, which I'm, you can tell I'm not a football guy. So he looked at the helmet and go, okay, this technology has not evolved since the 70s, okay? And same process, I sketched the, an idea down, went to the chair of mechanical engineering who I did not know, I just called him up and said, hey, can I get coffee? I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon, I take care of kids with concussion, I'm really interested in this problem, can we chat? Great guy, sat down, showed him what I was interested in. He went home, sketched some ideas that ultimately became the structures that we're using in this uh, device. And fast forward, there's 100 employees uh, in this company. Uh, they've raised now about $60 million. Uh, last year was the first year this was out. Russell Wilson wore it all year, and at the end of the year, he invested in the company, which was very telling for me personally that it worked, he had a great year. So these are the two guys that I founded this with. Per is the chair of mechanical engineering, director of the Boeing Research Lab. Dave Marver was a vice president in Medtronic. He was a CEO of Cardiac Science uh, in town, and then that company got acquired. And then Dave started to do some stuff in the university. And I met him through kind of some of the other things I was doing in business, and we had had lunch and just had a standing meeting to catch up. He came to my office. I go, Dave, he's like, what are you working on? I got this football helmet thing and I got this VR project. And he's like, football. And that's how this whole thing started. The three of us got together, we got a small grant. We ended up having basically something that was the size of a cigarette box that showed the column structure. And off of that, we started fundraising the company, launched it out of the university three months after we got together, basically. 
and now uh, we're doing football, a variety of different sports. We just got a uh, some nice news about a military contract, so we're changing liners and military helmets. They have a huge concussion problem. 80% of mild TBIs in the military are actually stateside training. Everybody thinks it's blast and penetrating injuries. It's not, and the military spent hundreds of millions for ballistics, you can take a nine millimeter to the shell, but you flip it over and there's five cents of padding inside. So we've worked on that liner and shown very significant force reduction. And so the military's taken an interest. This is ultimately uh, the football helmet here, designed from scratch to guys who quite frankly knew nothing about football. He's from Sweden, okay? And so those columns can compress and move there's still a hard shell. Football helmets were originally designed for, to prevent catastrophic injuries, not concussion. Skull fractures, subdural, epidural, they do a great job at that. Never designed for mitigation of rotation, which is what we think causes concussion. Let me see if this works. So I usually play this, I usually play this twice. So the first time, watch the helmet impact the anvil. This is the test called Noxy. This is what's used to certify a helmet. So you could buy it for your kid in like dicks. So you see how the helmet yields when it impacts that hard surface. I'm gonna play it again. Watch, actually watch the head form this time. You can see how it cushions as it comes in. So the way helmets are tested now, it's basically looking at the G-forces that that helmet uh, sustains when it hits on a linear uh, impact. The NFL testing that's come out and other things that uh, we've done incredibly uh, well on look also at rotation. And so the standards are evolving. So the first year we came out with the helmet was last year. It ranked number one the first year out on NFL testing. In the course of just eight months, the guys dropped more than half a pound out of the helmet, did some redesign to it, tested it, tested even better. So we ended up at number one and number two. The other helmets you see are the three leading helmets worn in the NFL. And what's very interesting this year, the NFL decided to say that the lower performing third are banned in the NFL. So this is like a shot across the bow and a very provocative move that they made because there are innumerable NCAA teams, high schools who have kids in helmets that are not good. And so this is an acknowledgement that technology can play a role in sports safety. And so I think this is gonna have very important downstream implications and I applaud them for making what's a pretty gutsy move to, to do that. And you know, we're, it's just fun for me to see now we have like 25 engineers and physicists in the company. So the way we approach sports is really different than a Rydell or a Schutt. We're a technology company and there's young guys, there's guys who decided to work for us and not go to Boeing. So it's been very fun to see this happen and there's just an amazing amount of energy there. Virginia Tech, as you guys know, also raid and look at uh, helmets and other sports equipment. First year that they looked at us, this came back a couple weeks ago. We ranked number one by significant margin again. This is the way the NFL does the testing. They know, looking at game film, where the impacts were that led to concussion. So they do a very deep dive on every concussion, try and recreate it, understand the biomechanics of that injury. The majority of injuries, uh, concussions, are on the side, and that's where we perform particularly well. So this is G-force um, uh, or uh, uh, rotational uh, acceleration compared to other helmets. So we're anywhere from 13 to 36 percent better. So for the neurosurgery crowd, I often reference a article that came out in neurosurgery. It's not a spectacular study, but if you drop the uh, uh, force um, by just a couple of, of Gs, you can actually reduce the concussion severity quite significantly. And so there was a study where they looked at old helmets, newer helmets, instrumented them, when they saw a reduction in uh, uh, G-force by not a significant amount, they saw a 40% drop in the concussion rate between those teams. And so 
you know, if we are even close to these numbers on the field here, then I'm hopeful that we're going to have a very significant uh, impact in uh, reducing the rate of concussion. But these are things that we have to prove out, and we're putting some pretty deep science to it now with computer simulation and finite element modeling and all this stuff as an intermediate step to clinical trials. This is one of my most fun things that we're doing now. We have a VR company that uh, got spun out of the university, started to get very interested in this. How much time do I have, by the way? Yeah. Am I okay? Okay. So I got very interested in this space about four and a half years ago. So VR was just coming out. Oculus just had their test kit developed <laughs> and was available. And it struck me that the operating room is super cumbersome, right? Every vendor has a device with a screen. It's rarely integrated in a meaningful way. If you're operating, you want to move the microscope. You either have the mouthpiece or you're grabbing and moving and then putting your hands back into the operative field. You want to look at the imaging studies. You can't really do it simultaneously, so you're turning away to look at a screen, review, whatever it is, your angiogram or MRI. So it struck me that there was an opportunity around virtual reality uh, in, in healthcare in particular. So same process, went to one of the uh, EE profs there, a brilliant guy had come back into the university from Intel and said, you know, I'm interested in this problem, like, can we chat about this? He brought his whole team to the operating room, they looked around, and then they educated me around a concept called light field imaging. So it's essentially this idea of a multi-camera array, and the computing processing speeds now are so good that you can create this mesh and interpolate between the camera angles. So what we have now is a fully immersive VR system uh, that uses this light array, and you can magnify in and out beyond the limits right now of a current microscope. We can put it potentially on an endoscope. So you can go from just normal kind of view of the patient to loop magnification to full-on microscope 25x magnification without losing your context on the patient, plus you're just standing there, so the ergonomics are very nice. But what's interesting is the computing speeds only in the last couple of years have caught up with the ability of this type of technology. So visual processing, we know like the refresh rate on your TV is a certain thing, so you don't see it flicker, right? But it's actually flickering, you just can't in, uh, perceive that. So we have a window of about 100 milliseconds to play with this data set that we acquire. So we've done some studies now where we can actually, in real time, take uh, CT or MRI data and overlay it uh, on that anatomy and warp it. And so we had one of our spine colleagues come over. We took a, um, uh, a sawbone spine, did a CT, brought it into the lab. This person came in fully immersed in VR drop pedicle screws with this system perfectly accurately. And so we think that this is gonna be the real wave of evolution in the operating room. The idea that there's gonna be a stealth machine and an O-arm and fluoro, I can guarantee you in 10 years, all that stuff will be in a museum, okay? The microscope you use now, that Dr. Roden popularized in the 70s, the window of the lifespan of the microscope is about five years in my estimate and we will not be using that anymore. It'll be in a museum. Ground glass is gone. So loops, microscopes, all that stuff will no longer exist, I suspect, in about five to 10 years. So we've got a team now, computer vision PhDs in uh, Pioneer Square that are working on this technology, and we have partnerships now with uh, Intel, NVIDIA, and HTC to develop this. And so this may be a nice conversation to talk about working with you guys as we develop these type of technologies, because they're amazing. It's science fiction come alive. Every time I go in there and I put on these things, you just kind of imagine what this could be. So you're doing an aneurysm, you want to clip it, you don't know what's on the back side. With this, you can look and see the back as you're doing it. Fascinating stuff, right? So it would really change and revolutionize the way we're doing this and the implications for teaching, telesurgery, robotics are all there. And that's where kind of our world is going in the next few years. So for the younger people who are just kind of starting their practice, what you're doing and using right now is gonna be very, very different in the next uh, few years. 
So this is the last one I'll talk about. This is where I've helped one of my colleagues at Children's, so this is an anesthesiologist. I uh, got very interested in the idea of like, how do you do QI improvement in the hospital? Well, it's very hard to get the data, right, out of the EMR and actually do something effective. So when we do that at Children's, we go to a data analyst, they take two, three weeks, give you back a data set that you're supposed to make some decision on, right? So he got frustrated by this. So he developed a software uh, platform that he calls MD Metrics that basically can pull structured data out of the EMR and you can do real-time queries. So he does the example of somebody's in the PACU and you change a medication. What's the outcome of that? Is the pain score better or worse? What's their time in PACU? And he can show you that by you know changing from a very expensive medicine to a cheaper one, that there's no change in outcome. And so you change your practice and the system can you know, eliminate significant costs. And he's shown some other things with GI surgery that some small fundamental changes in how they manage postoperatively has saved children's $900,000 across uh, this one particular type of uh, uh, procedure. So we have smart people thinking about these things. Changes will be occurring, big data, machine learning, all these things are gonna really impact the way that we practice. <laughs> and it's gonna be people like in this room that come up with the ideas that are gonna kind of lead that next way. But you gotta take your idea and make it real. So I'm gonna conclude with this. So the idea, an idea to me is less than 1%. I have ideas all the time and they're useless unless you actually do something with it, okay? So just because you think of something and you write it down, that doesn't mean anything to me anymore. I used to think that was kind of important. It, it, you gotta do something with it. You gotta find a team and people who care. You gotta protect your idea. I think you gotta actually get it outside of the academic world and even the walls of like a facility like this, you gotta get it outside of here and, and make it live and breathe on its own to be real. Don't play business guy. Like Dan, the guy, the very last thing, he's been the CEO of that company. He's a wonderful guy. He acknowledges he should not be the CEO. And so we're actively looking for somebody to take over the leadership there, which he acknowledges is the right, right move. Grant seed funding, early uh, uh, equity uh, seed rounds and investment are important. Stay involved. If you wanna see it happen and you wanna benefit from it, you need to stay engaged. And for me, it's been incredibly fun. Like I, you know, as you're saying, like I got my PhD in functional MRI. I haven't done that since the third week I was in practice here. And I have so much fun with this. Like I always thought like these guys like Elon Musk or whatever, they'd build a company for a billion dollars, they'd sell it and you'd never see them again. They'd just be on an island sipping martinis and they'd never resurface. But these guys do it over and over and over again. And the reason is it's super fun. It's very addictive. And to build a team and see your idea actually grow. Last year, I was doing a sideline for the Seahawks and Russell walked off the field right in front of me in this helmet that I like literally sketched some of the ideas on uh, you know, a, a napkin and, and went to the engineer guys and said, please help me make something of, of these ideas. It was just a crazy moment, right? And it's so fun. So I would encourage you guys to do it. And it is a lot of work. This was me a, a week ago. We're selling so many helmets that they need you know, skilled guys to be helping do stuff. So I went and put stickers on face masks for four hours because you got to just get it done. And so I encourage you guys to think about this. It's a nice extension of your professional life and can be very meaningful and extend uh, uh, what you do to help patients. So thank you. And I'm happy to take questions.